eyesight has to be established from birth. It can't be corrected if an individual never experienced it. Some studies have proven. The pathways in the brain have to be established from birth on as input through the eye is established. And it was established that an individual would need around five or six years of sight to be able to dream a visual dream. At some point after the loss of sight, a person will begin dreaming differently. They dream differently. They, they will dream with, with less of a picture form and more in other sensory input. If the establishing of our eyesight works out well, we can still have other challenges. One being the inability to distinguish some colors. Uh, we would refer to this as being colored blind. Uh, this characteristic seems to be more common than we may think with a, with a higher quantity residing in males. It was through laser surgery that something amazing was discovered. It, was, it, it wasn't what was being done in the OR or anything of that sort, but it was a discovery that happened outside the operating room. After laser surgery, the surgeons were removing the protective eye, the eyewear from the room. Now you may think, well, they didn't need to do that, but they did. The usage of, of the glasses allowed the natural colors to be saturated and appear brighter. It was later discovered that certain types of color blindness could be benefited. Some of you have probably seen the video of a, a 10 year old boy seeing colors for the first time. He sat patiently with anticipation in a lawn chair as he was handed a small box that would change his world forever. He had an idea that something great was on the horizon, but he didn't know just how. As he opened the box and unravels the, the wrapping, he displays a pair of sunglasses that he opens before putting them on. In an instant, his facial expressions change, and he immediately begins looking around, and then it happened. It happened. You, you can visually, visually see when sensory overload occurs. He's now seen the world with colors he didn't know existed. Within a moment, he begins to display tears, tears of joy as he sat there, awestruck, just trying to take in all that his eyes are allowing for the first time. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. We're reading from Acts 2, verse 17. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. God is correcting vision. This was to be and is a life-changing event when God's Holy Spirit is poured out on humanity, but we know that. This is where we are right now at this moment. We're, we are experiencing this. We sit here face to face with the meaning of Pentecost on the day commemorating when God poured out his spirit on mankind. In the time we have this morning, we will examine and handle, if you will, some of the meaning we find in this day. We will look at certain examples and draw certain Conclusions, we'll see where we should seek first the kingdom of God. We'll see where we should keep purity in the church and also examine the strengthening of one another. I, as many others, grew up in the church representing a second generation approach to God's word. If there was only one difference, then it would have to be the aha moment. And of course, there's others as well. 
It's still the same calling. It's still the same potential, as we've learned through scripture, but not everyone has that aha moment in that regard. No matter which approach we have come to know God's, God's word, let's try and view this with the wonder that occurred on that day. There was a time in relatively recent years of the church where, where birthdays uh, weren't acknowledged or celebrated so much. As a youth, I lived through that era. And some of the, the most wonderful gifts I'd ever received was during those years. It wasn't a new bike. It wasn't some motorized thing that I was going to play with. Well, it was in a sense. It was the old stuff that was broken. It was handed to me to have fun with it. Take it apart, if you will. You don't have to put it back together. And I had great joy with that, figuring out how things worked, why they didn't work. And so today, we're, we're not going to tear something apart, but rather search it out. God's word never fails to work. So if, there is fail, if, if there's a failure rate, we'd want to know where the disconnect occurs. Turn with me for background over to Joel 2, verse 21. Let's lay the foundation here. Joel 2, verse 21. We're going to be breaking in to this prophecy. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Verse 22, be not afraid, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the, the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the, the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. We, we don't really have much of a connect to this agricultural term, but in certain studies we find that there were two seasons of rain. If the first rain didn't occur, the soil would be so tough, so hard that they, they, couldn't, they couldn't plow it. And of course that plays into the different uh, crops that they would yield as well, different harvests. Verse 24, and the, the, the floor shall be full of wheat and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. Now we stop here and we notice something. God often has the actual event and types that point or represent to more. We know that. Um, in the case of uh, the wave sheaf offering, we have a foreshadowing with a physical barley, and then we have an actual with Christ, and then we have a future event tying directly into that. So it's through these repetitions, if you will, uh, we're able to see a process, and this process is a way that we can understand how God's mind works. We can see how he makes these things come about, and that's important as we look deeper into some of the meaning uh, of the day as it was fulfilled to some 2,000 years ago and continues to be today. In verse 25, and I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has uh, dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. Now here again, we, we look at what is happening. We can, we can only focus on, we can choose to focus on the desolation talked about here or we can carry this out a bit. Now if, if you talk to a first generation Christian and, and one of the common themes may be, if you ask them the question, where would you have been had God not called you? And I hear this answer, I, I don't know where I would have ended up, but I know it wouldn't have been good. Because it's an understanding that the pathway was incorrect, and God opened their eyes to that. We start to see a... Uh, a type of reconciliation or where God brings his people back to him. And so 
Uh, continuing on here in verse 27, And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. So now we look at process and a timeline in, in the next few verses. In verse 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in heaven and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Now, we can place that in a timeline. We can, we can project that forward. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be, de uh, be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and, it, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. We just covered an immense amount of time here in just five verses with, with a process that God has put into place, bringing his people back to him. Now we focus today on verse 28. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now this was prophesied to happen here, and it was, it was given as an instruction as well by Jesus Christ. Let's turn to John 14. John 14, Christ is, is comforting his disciples here. He's explaining to them that he has to leave them. John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. When God's presence, his, his Holy Spirit, is pulled from someone it's 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 not a it's not a favorable time to say the least but they were worried the disciples were were concerned because this individual the, the their lord was going to be uh, pulled from them and they had deep concerns about this um, we we can reference psalm 51 we don't need to turn there David realized what was missing when it was. After sinning, he cried out to God. He cried out to be restored. So we can understand that, that when God removes any aspect of, of the Holy Spirit, and in this case, Jesus Christ would have to leave them, and they didn't understand that, uh, the, the implication there. Uh, David said, Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Um, I don't advise trying this, but anytime we sin, we, we, we put that wedge between us and God. It, it takes the relationship away. David was referring to that. But the same feeling could be transferred to the, to the disciples when they realized that something was going to be removed. And David talked about, do not cast me away from your presence. He cried this out. He caused that. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. When talking about fear of the Lord, it's reasonable to consider how we might cut, cut ourselves off from God through sin, unrepented sin. Now, he said he would never leave us or forsake us. That being said, we can separate us, ourselves, from him. The disciples didn't fall into the cate that category of, of sin, but instead they were having a functioning relationship that was going to change. It was going to be different, and they didn't know how. So they were worried. They were concerned greatly because they understood the physical as they were experiencing it. In verse 12, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do 
also and greater works than these he will do because I go to my father and whatever you ask in my name that will I do that the father may be glorified in the son if you ask anything in my name I will do it what does that mean to us if we're looking at a promise we have to decide if it's specific or if it's to the church or if it's to us as individuals and the church what would we be asking in his name that he would fulfill well we're talking about the will of God here in verse 15 if you love me keep my commandments that's a point that often gets lost in, in today's religions. Sometimes it's just a matter of, well, I, I, I have received Jesus Christ in my heart, and that's good enough. I'm there, once saved, always saved. I have received him, I accept him. But here in Scripture says, keep my commandments. Well, there's, there's more to this then. In verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that it may abide with you forever. Well, we begin to see what and how God was going to accomplish by the pouring out of his spirit. There's a process here. Verse 17, the spirit of truth, which the world cannot receive because it neither sees it nor knows it. Many, many translations put in a pronoun. It should be it and not he. But you know it, for it dwells with you and will be in you. It's important to look at that as we study the meaning of today. We're looking at a, a huge change right here, dwelling with or in. In verse 18, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. So it'll be important to understand verse 17, the Holy Spirit was dwelling with them. It would, it would then be in them. The, the, the pre-answering to a calling, perhaps, as, as we would look at it, as, as God is calling us, that Holy Spirit will be working with us. After baptism, it'll be working in us. And we, we, can, we can see that difference. And now, as we look at and handle this topic today, we begin to see central truths, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was... Uh, reassuring them that they would not be left to fend for themselves. That's important because they, they, were, they were disciples. They were followers of Jesus. They were, they were being led and taught. The relationship was close. It mirrored the relationship that the Holy Spirit would have in them later. They were being led and taught. He said, I will not leave you orphans. The only way he could make that promise is by sending the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's uh, jump over to uh, John 16, verse 5, to, to see that briefly. And we'll come back to verse 14 here in a minute. John 16, verse 5. But now I go away to him who sent me, and, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. It's interesting that Jesus was telling them that it was to their benefit. They, they, they didn't see the benefit right there. What they did see was his words. He, he was telling them, I'm leaving you. I have to go away now. They, they hadn't experienced the promise yet, which Jesus was giving them. It would be necessary for him to fulfill the wave sheaf for this, for this comforter, this Holy Spirit, to be poured out on all people. Now, we studied these things some 50 days ago, how, how Jesus would, would have to, uh, to come and be that Christ the prophecies that would need to be fulfilled to establish verse number uh, verse 7 here but going back to John 14 and verse 26 but the helper the holy spirit whom the uh, 
uh, which the Father will send in my name, it will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance all things that I said to you. As we read the, the word remembrance, it, it has more to do with ownership uh, than it would the, the tradi uh, traditional definition of the word here. The Holy Spirit will bring into ownership all the things Jesus had said. Now, to live a transformed life, we would have to have this helper, God's Holy Spirit. Next, we look, we look at an account that will showcase some of the power the Holy Spirit offers and, and even a disconnect to it, all in the same example. Um, turn with me over to Acts 5. What we examine in Acts uh, 5 here will present a, a, a choice to any Christian as they, as they follow Jesus Christ. Acts 5, and in verse 1, But a certain man named Ananias with Sophia, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife also being aware of it, and, and brought a certain part and laid it at, at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your, uh, in, in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. In verse 5, then Ananias, hear, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon those who heard these things. And, and the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried, carried him out, and buried him. This, this entire account happens so fast with such, such a sensationalism. It, it, it leaves the reader questioning what was so uh, egregious about what happened here that it cost uh, two people their life. A couple of things come to mind, but, but let's take a little time to look at the workings of the Holy Spirit. We begin with Peter. What we learn about Peter in the book of Acts is, is that he wasn't the same as he was months earlier. So we, we, can, we can look at a timeline of sorts and we can start to see change. We can see um, how this works. Turn with me over to Luke 22. For context, let's read uh, verse 1. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, Luke 22, verse 1, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. We know how this went. We know how this started. Let's drop down to verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Now we're dropping down to the middle of the context here after the Passover service. I won't ask for a show of hands if this has ever happened to you. Of course, you don't get the word that Satan is sifting you. We don't get the word that Satan has asked for us to sift us as wheat. How, how would that message come to you? Well, it, it wouldn't be by a robocall. I find those things are pretty effective at interrupting a day, although it might be efficient. It might, or it may or may not start with a, a promotion on the job, or perhaps the lack thereof. I believe it might start like a, a day from Job, like any other day for a few moments. Everything just falls apart. I'm not referring to loss of a loved one, but, but rather all those things we put around our person to make us feel as if we figured it all out. Our hedge. It's our hedge. The, the things that make us feel fluffy and with volume. And a few other things as well. We don't often think about sifting wheat anymore. Uh, most of us don't harvest wheat, and for the most part, uh, we're, we're much removed from that particular grain except in products. 
when, when I was young, one of the chores given to me was sifting wheat. Uh, I was given a choice, hope for a windy day and pour it from one container to another as the chaff and the, the light particles blew away or sort it all out by hand at the kitchen table. Now I remember going to the corner of the house where the, the wind pressure was the highest and watching as all that, that fluff just, just blew away. What remained was the true article without debris or straw. It was, it was now ready to be milled into flour which was, was used in bread. My mom used to bake homemade bread. My, my dad would supply the, uh, the, the milled wheat for it. So Jesus would know all about this. And he said to Peter, but I have prayed for you that your faith should, should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Well, there's something interesting when you're, you're sifting through wheat. If it's a windy day, some of the wheat falls out of the process. It can be stripped away. You lose some of the product. You don't want to lose that. You'll have more work to do later. But if it's a windy day, or if the trials are really, really harsh, there may be a concern that it could strip away some of the wheat. And Jesus prayed for Peter. Verse 33, but he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. I would not want to be told that. Luke 22, verse 57, but he, dropping down here, but he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. This is after the event in the garden. They're finding out if Peter was there. Who was this guy? Somebody identifies him. And Peter denies it. And after a little while, another saw him and said, you also are of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. <laughs> I am not that person that reached for his sword. I'm not that individual. In verse 59, then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed saying, Surely this fellow also was with him for, well, he's a Gentile, it was, it's stated. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are saying. Well, immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and, and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. If we compare Peter's actions in Acts 5 to the account here in Luke 22, we notice, a, we notice a change in a person. Peter, through the Holy Spirit, is taking on different characteristics. We take on different characteristics, and we'll get to those in a little bit. Let's take a brief look uh, a little further back in time. It's important to understand what, what the Holy Spirit will do. We have to examine this. We have to handle this. Turn with me to Matthew 16. Matthew 16 and in verse 20. I'll be reading from the modern King James. Matthew 16, verse 20. Then he warned his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. Can you just kind of imagine Peter being told this by Jesus Christ? I don't know what Peter was doing when he heard those words, but I can just imagine he's reaching across, he's feeling if the handle of that sword is present, saying, yeah, I have my sword. I'll protect you. That's not a problem. Peter was that way. But we, 
we notice what's being said here. Matthew 16, verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, God be gracious to you, Lord. This shall never be to you. What happened next here in verse had to be shocking to Peter. Let's read. Matthew 16, verse 23. But he, Christ, turned and said to Peter, Go, Satan, you are an offense to me. For you do not savor the things that are of God, but those that are of men. In verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In verse 25, for whoever desires to save his life shall lose it, and whoever desires to lose his life for my sake shall find it. Jesus made this point quite clear to Peter and established the importance of God's will over self-will. It's interesting that, that Jesus said, go Satan. That's a strong statement. It doesn't speak of Satan having known certain details of God's plan here. It speaks to the, the elevation of self. Prominence and, and the lack of faith would be near the top of that list. We look at these examples here to establish a, a timeline, a process, with a direction. We, we've read how the story goes, and, and Peter, Peter doesn't stay in this condition. Rather, he shows the growth that we have come to expect with the Holy Spirit working with someone and then in them. It's, it's become expected. It's what the Holy Spirit does. It transforms. So let's go back to Acts 5 here and see something. Acts 5, verse 3. We'll read this again. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Peter was speaking with boldness. It's one of the characteristics that the Holy Spirit gives us. We speak it in boldness. He could see the root of the problem in Ananias and, and the wife of Ananias, by the way. The Holy Spirit is in Peter here and is discerning with that sharp two-edged sword. He was speaking with the word of God with, with the power of the Holy Spirit. For your notes, write down Hebrews uh, 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. Well, that's interesting. And of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creation hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom, uh, who we give account, uh, give account. Peter didn't strike Ananias down. He didn't judge him unto death. He did point out the misrepresentation that was trying to be sold here. At the heart of the matter was the heart. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, Peter asked. This, this would have uh, had to have been uh, revealed to Peter. It had to have been re revealed to him. And we, we read in John 14, verse 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the, uh, which the Father will send in my name, it will teach you all things. Okay, so we, we start to string this together. We start to view not only what this day represent, represents, but the process that this Holy Spirit has. In Acts 4 and verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So we see something here. We, we see what was happening uh, in these early years of the church. We see action. God's Holy Spirit was poured out, and it wasn't quiet. It wasn't 
It didn't go unnoticed. This is huge. In verse 32, now the multitude of those who believed, it's important that we understand that scripture says who believed, were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone, uh, anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with, with great power, the, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. Now, it's important to see this setting, that the place was shaken. We don't live in California. I don't choose to. But I understand the ground shakes a little bit there. Can you imagine being in services on the day of Pentecost, going through scripture like we're doing right now, and then you just start to feel something. Those that can feel it first, they'll, you know, did a truck go by outside on the highway? You know, one of those things. People can feel that. And all of a sudden you, you start to, all of a sudden, boom. You hear something, you feel something. It gets your attention. You don't keep doing what you're doing, you stop. It's like, what was that? That's not normal, that's different. So the place was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and God's word was spoken with boldness. It went out, it went out strong. Scripture goes on to say those who had would share, and this was, this was done by placing the money of the sale at the apostles' feet. They shared. There were some that didn't have, there were some that did. They sold and they shared. Now, in scripture it says, uh, and great grace was upon them. We can, we can kind of skim over certain details that help to flesh this out for us. This grace, it means uh, the goodwill or, or loving kindness and, and favor according to Thayer definition here. Merciful kindness. We can start to see what Ananias was doing. He didn't, he didn't do what he did for the sake of the church. He did it for another reason. We're told that. Ananias would al allow the wrong thought pattern to in uh, enter his thinking, and, and the desire within his heart was, was turned to self. And he was convicted by the Holy Spirit to which he lied. The, the big takeaway here is the power of God, the Holy Spirit, will not be entertained by selfish ambitions. It never ends well. This passage was recorded in scripture for a reason. The message was spelled out then, and it would be similar today. Verse 11 so great fear came upon the church and upon all who heard these things. Do we have any connect to this? Well, to make myself comfortable, I'll say I don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Is that true? Well, you have to answer those things. We don't want to be caught lying to the Holy Spirit. And what would that entail? Well. Can we in God's church today, 2019, lie to the Holy Spirit? Can we lie to God? That's the question we need to ask as we go through this. Jesus explained this, this at the end of Luke 9. Turn with me, if you will. Luke 9, we'll be breaking into context here. Jesus is having this conversation. And at first, it may appear the references to an acceptance of our calling, but but we see what was spoken here, Luke 9, verse 59. Let's read this. Then he said to another, follow me. This is Christ talking with somebody, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own, but, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Now, we've studied that before. It's... it's there's more to it than just burying somebody. It's a process. There's a grieving process. There's a length of time. There's, there's more to what we see as these words, as they uh, uh, accomplished that back then. Verse 61, 
And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. In other words, yeah, um, hold on a minute. I'll catch up with you. I have company for the next six months, and I, I need to entertain. I need to take care of them. I need to feed them. But Jesus said to him, no one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Well, so as we've been called for a purpose, we would need to be about that purpose. It is compared to putting one's hand to the plow. We, we have a different direction to go in doing a work. No one who remains on the fence, as, as we would say, is fit to move forward. As Jesus puts it, is fit for the kingdom of God. If we have accepted the calling we've been given, then we will be about the Father's business. And looking at this day and what it means, it's important to understand God's expectations. Um, Ananias was found lacking when it, when it came to being honest to God, and, and it was shown that misrepresentation was not to be in the church. We consider one of the points earlier mentioned is uh, purification within the church. Looking at Peter's role in this, we can see where he was doing what he was instructed to do by Jesus Christ. We read that in Luke 22, verse 32. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, Scripture said, strengthen your brethren. Strengthen your brethren. What are we to be doing? What are we to be doing today? As we read something like this, well, that's about Peter. That's not about us. Or is it? Jesus Christ prayed for us as well. We know that. We see that. John 17, verse 20 for your notes. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Referring to generations down, down the line. We know about the cornerstone that was laid and and that God is still putting a foundation for what happens next in his plan. We are called to be kings and priests for his purpose, the purpose of expanding his family. This day represents the next step in expanding his family. What would be some of our takeaways um, as a church, as we were as we look at these verses. Even more specific, what is our responsibility as a congregation? What's our responsibility to these verses as a congregation? These are found as we go back through what we just went over. Um, they're, they're embodied in Luke 22 and verse 32. We'll examine that briefly. It, the, the, this is, uh, turn with me over to Luke 22 and verse uh, 23. This is right after Jesus said, I, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And they're, they're still standing in the room that they used. Luke 22, verse 23. Let's, let's view this. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. Talking about who, who, would, who would turn Jesus in amongst them. Who, who is this individual? Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the, on the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who, for who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you, as the one who serves. Jesus Christ was speaking to the disconnect that they had about this. 
They thought it was all about position, pecking order, if you will, status. So he was speaking to their understanding, to the things they were used to seeing and acting out. He, he was going to where they were. He was teaching them. Now, culturally, this, this one understanding, of course, is not perceived. We live in a society where uh, fame, popularity, public affirmation rules the day. Apparently, you can be famous for just being famous. No underlying cause, but if you get enough airtime, you'll become famous for some reason. So it permeates the very essence of what, what we can find all around. Um, a few years back, my wife and I decided on a cruise for our 25th anniversary. It was an amazing experience uh, to travel to various ports. I enjoyed it, although those with us didn't think that I did, being medicated most of the trip, but I did. I did enjoy it. It was very, very unique and fascinating. I just had to live in a smaller world. Um, one thing which really showcased the pervasive uh, attitude that makes up much of uh, our, our culture today was the behavior of some on the cruise. Um, one individual was berating uh, the help as though, as though it was expected. Uh, this individual was treating the, the, the person working on this uh, ship, treating him like a dog worse than a dog, really, treating him poorly. Um, the backstory on some of the help was they may or may not have known English uh, very well, but they won in a lottery of sorts to be able to work on the ship. I didn't know this until it was explained to me how, how some, of, uh, some of this happens. Uh, it, it became their ticket to a better life, if only for a season. They would work much of their waking moments in an effort to continue being part of part of that dream. It's what they wanted to be. They, they came from an area that was uh, uh, economically uh, not very well off and so this was this was a ticket to get out. And so they, they were eager to be there. I'm not saying that all cruise lines do this. I'm saying some had. Now it was explained to us that the endless lines of food we selected from was, was not the fare that they would enjoy. Uh, their world was limited and strictly defined. Uh, when we witnessed the lack of regard for another human being, it placed a stain on the memory of the experience. It, uh, it, it was a sad, sad moment to see people do that, to take advantage of another individual like that. But, Whenever we see this type of attitude being displayed, it, it should be a red flag. Uh, we probably won't change others who enjoy this, but we don't need to take part in it. Um, let's continue in verse 28. Verse 28 here. But you are those who have continued with me in trials, and I bestow upon you the, a kingdom, just as my father bestowed uh, one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. In verse 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, he's getting his attention. He's saying his name twice. Could you imagine if your name is being hollered out twice? It gets, it gets my attention most of the time. Here, Jesus is saying, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you. Okay, that's that gulp moment. Why? What did I do now? You know, why, why does he want me? That he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Verse 33, but he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Well, we look at this verse 22. Let's pull three points from this, our three points that we talked about earlier. We've been showcasing it through this study so far, but let's, let's really uh, uh, 
underline this. We'll quickly go through these three points that resonate through time and build a healthy congregation. So we see that, uh, that your faith should not fail. That was the instruction. Christ was praying that your faith should not fail. Your, your faith should not fail. Well, this faith here used is, of course, a persuasion or a, a moral conviction. I think that would be due diligence that we would pray for one another that our brother or our sister's faith does not fail. We don't know what they go through. We don't always walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. So it would be prudent if we, if we did that. This path that we've been called to uh, and the understanding of the, the God family, we touched off on this a bit, but let's, let's, simply, let's simplify with saying, seek you first the kingdom of God. Seek you first the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, verse 33 states, but seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The day of Pentecost helps us to see how God is establishing his kingdom during and through this era. We see firsthand how he expands and adds to his family. Before we get too caught up in, in our moment, we, we would want to consider something else. Isaiah 9, verse 7, you might want to hold your place in Matthew. Isaiah 9, verse 7 I had this conversation recently. I hadn't had it for several decades. Isaiah 9 and verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Well, that's interesting. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth ever, uh, forever, uh, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Isaiah 9, verse 7. Do we consider that? I think we can get caught up in the moment sometimes. I have my problems throughout the week. I have my trials. Satan does what he can. We have to be careful that we don't become the center of our universe. We have to understand God's plan and not our will. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. We used to discuss this back in the 70s. I know I'm kind of dating myself. But it's interesting. We used to have this conversation. So, as a cautionary statement, we can't get caught up too much on where we are. We have to look at the big picture. We have to look at God's picture, God's will. And Jesus went on to say, when you have returned to me, to Peter, he knew Peter was going to be tried and tested. He also knew Satan would do all that he was allowed, including tempting. Everything that God would allow would be on the table. The indication in, in scripture is, when you have returned. Well, this pictures the triumph that Peter Peter was to have over the evil one. The understanding is that we will win every battle we face as we have God's Holy Spirit working in our life. As a congregation, this speaks to keeping purity in the church. We can make the argument, well, it doesn't matter what I do after sundown. That's my business. Well, we're talking about keeping purity in the church. If it wasn't important, it wouldn't be mentioned. John 16, verse 7. If you turn there, please. John 16, and verse 7. John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for, for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send it unto you. And when it has come, it will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Well, we know judgment's on the house of God right now. We are in that judgment. In verse 9, 
uh, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I, I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the, the prince of, the world, uh, of this world is judged. In verse 12, I, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When it, the spirit of truth, is come, it will guide you into all truth, for it shall not speak of itself, but whatsoever it shall hear, that shall it speak, and it will show you things to come. In John 16, verse 14, it shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto me, or uh, unto you. We are building in part on the earlier holy day, holy days in that we have discernment of sin. Uh, we're, we're part of that called out to be able to discern the sin through his spirit. This comforter that was sent, this Holy Spirit given by God is the basis in establishing what Christ was explaining in these verses. On, on the individual emphasis, we live this every day as instructed, and it's through the Holy Spirit that this would even be possible. Ex expanding this out, as we congregate with, with one accord, we are doing this at the congregational level. We move to our, our third instruction and characteristic found in the early church. Jesus instructed Peter to strengthen the brethren when he returned from Satan or from the, the testing or the, 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 the sifting as it was. As we covered in Acts 5, 1 through 5, Peter did in fact strengthen the brethren. He did that. He was given the understanding necessary to perceive what Ananias and his wife were trying to do and he, he called it out. That It seems a bit extreme, but keep in mind the magnitude of what God was doing at that time. Corruption was not going to get a foothold as God's spirit was poured out on mankind here. Our third point is strengthen one another. Strengthen one another. This will occur through uh, conviction and the courage to speak the gospel. Now this, this comes with some cautions. It does. But let's see how Paul, Paul does this. Turn with me over to Romans 15. We'll be breaking into the context here. Paul is explaining Christian life and service. Romans uh, 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in, in believing that you may abound in hope and by the power of the Holy Spirit. In verse 14, now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to admonish there's that word, admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as, as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We see another echo here of of what the day represents as that Holy Spirit is poured out on all of mankind. We understand through Paul's writings that we, we would admonish one another. What does that mean? What are we supposed to do? Well, Strong's uh, definition puts it, uh, to caution or reprove gently, to warn. Now, before we start a list, it's important to understand what's being done. For most, it means walking a mile with someone before mentioning these types of things. To repro uh, reprove gently means just that, gently. With that being said, take the time to build relationships that will support such an exchange. And it does take time. It does take time. As we study and go through what it means to have God's Holy Spirit available to, to mankind, we can learn more about what roles and responsibilities are expected. The first fruits have been given responsibilities. 
to fulfill in their Christian life and through scripture, we're, we're able to view some today. Seek first the kingdom of God, keep purity in the church, strengthen one another. God has pulled back the veil for all of us at this time. As we take a look back at this day some 2,000 years ago, let's not forget how it gets us to the future in God's kingdom.